Welcome to the Steady Anchor Podcast, a podcast in Christian faith and practice, highlighting doctrine and discipleship in the local church. I'm Luke, and welcome to the show. Hello, and welcome back to the Steady Anchor Podcast. I am Luke, your host. Today, we're going through another book review, today of What is a Healthy Church by Mark Dever, published by Crossway Publishers. As uh, I've explained before, one of the main purposes of this show is not to kind of continue sharing my own thoughts or kind of giving my opinion on stuff. The point of the show really is to continue trying to ground myself and you, the listener, in Christ, who is our hope, who is the anchor of our soul. And to do that, I want to push you and try and connect others to deeper, more meaningful resources like this book, like programs like and ministries like Nine Marks Ministries with more established, more experienced, more knowledgeable, wise, and holy men and women of God who have gone before us, uh, who are living in our time, who we can learn from, the people who have lived in generations past, the people who hopefully are becoming leaders growing to, in the church today. So again, one of the, the main purposes of me doing this podcast is to help you, the listener, and myself through this process to grow in love and trust and intimacy with the risen Christ, to understand who he is, what he has done for us, what he calls us to, and how we're supposed to live in light of that, to understand the glory and the depth of the gospel, that we are saved and reconciled to God by faith through Jesus Christ, to, to understand that God's word, the scriptures, are given to us for our understanding, for our equipment. And the church is God's people, God's gathering of worshipers, people who are called to worship him in spirit and in truth, coming together to, to live in community, to reflect the character and love of God through the way that they live. And so having a healthy church, having a healthy understanding of what a church is, is essential to living a, a bountiful, a fruitful, a joy and fruit producing Christian life. Not only for us personally as Christians, like obviously I want to enjoy my time in the church, I want to enjoy the fellowship of believers, but also that it would bear the fruit of evangelism, that it would bear the fruit of doctrine and discipleship, that people would grow in their knowledge and love for their creator, that they would come to know him, they would be saved from their sin, turning from their sin to Christ, who is the savior of all who come to him in faith. So, uh, you know, just a quick recap throughout the show, you'll find, um, well, you'll find on our social media, we're on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Steady Anchor Pod. We're posting stuff every day of the week. We're posting quotes and Bible verses regularly, daily. We're posting uh, pictures and graphics and stuff like that. We're linking to articles from ministries like Nine Marks, like Reformanda Men, like Core Christianity and Ligonier, people who know what they're talking about, people who who know and love God's word deeply. Um, so we're always, always trying to point you, the listener, back to deeper, greater sources. Like, I know that I personally, I'm a college student. I'm a young guy. I am not a pastor yet. And so there's a lot of experience. There's a lot of knowledge. There's a lot of personal holiness that I don't have that other people do. There are places where I still have much room to grow. And so my goal here is not for you to become my biggest fan. I certainly hope that you aren't. My goal is to point you back to competent, qualified, godly men and women who can help you to grow in your understanding, to point you to the deeper resources in a Christian faith, to truly help you to get deeper in your understanding of and love for Christ. So, this book, uh, What is a Healthy Church? by Mark Dever. As I said, it's published by Crossway Publishers. Just about any book published by Crossway, I think, is worth the read. Even if you might disagree with what you find in it, I think it's at least going to be informed well by the scriptures. Like, I don't think I've ever seen a book by Crossway that I wouldn't ever even consider buying. Like, if someone is like, hey, would you like a book? Here's a free book. If it has the little Crossway logo on it, take it. Um, and even other things like Nine Marks. Nine Marks is a fantastic ministry. It's one I link the articles on uh, on social media all the time. The articles are well written. They are pastorally focused. You can tell the heart behind it. 
uh, coming from multiple different perspectives, but united around the truth of God's word and the reality of Christ's saving work in the gospel. So the, uh, the author, Mark Dever, is the founder and chairman, I think, of Nine Marks Ministries. He started this as a ministry. Uh, he is also a pastor of a church. According to the back of the book, he is the author of several books and articles and serves as the senior pastor of Capitol Hill Baptist Church in Washington, D.C. Along with his pastoral responsibilities, Dr. Dever also ministers as the executive director of Nine Marks. Dever and his wife Connie live with their son in D.C. Now, Mark Dever is just one of those pastors who is always tries to be humble, who tries to be clear and kind, even when he's disagreeing with someone, who his pastoring uh, is is genuine shepherding. Like, I have learned so much from the Nine Marks ministry, from their articles, from his sermons, from his podcast. They have a podcast called Preacher's... No. Is it? No. It's Pastor's Talk. Pastor's Talk by Nine Marks. You can find it on wherever you're streaming thing. I use Spotify because I don't have an Apple product because I'm poor. Um, so find that wherever it is, especially if you're someone who's looking like me to go into ministry, who feels a calling from God. It is a fantastic resource. Um, but just to continue the kind of preview on the back of the book, it says, what is an ideal church and how can you tell? How does it look different from other churches? More importantly, how does it act differently, especially in society? Many of us aren't sure how to answer those questions, even though we probably have some preconceived idea. But with this book, you don't have to wonder anymore. Author Mark Dever seeks to help believers recognize the key characteristics of a healthy church expositional preaching, biblical theology, and a right understanding of the gospel. Dever then calls us to develop those characteristics in our own churches by following the example of New Testament authors and addressing church members. From pastors to pew sitters, Dever challenges all believers to do their part in maintaining the local church. What is a healthy church offers timeless truths and practical principles to help each of us fulfill our God-given roles in the body of Christ. Don't you just love it when a book back actually tells you what the book's about? I hate those re those book backs with gen just generic reviews like, oh, Cindy from the, the uh, Tuxatani Post said that it was a thrilling read. Like, that's not helpful at all. Tell me what the book's actually about. Anyway, side tangent. Um, so I'm going to be walking through the book, just taking out the general outline. I'll give you the skeleton of the book give you some of the main points with a little bit of explanation and encourage you to go and pick this up for yourself. It's an easy enough read. It's, let's see, what's the page count here? It's 126 pages, short book. This is only a couple inches tall and a couple inches wide. It's basically a pocket edition. Uh, it's a shorter version of the book, Nine Marks of a Healthy Church. It's basically the book that started that ministry of his. Um, that's a big couple hundred pages. So this is a, a shortened version giving an explanation of those nine marks of a healthy church with uh, some additional explanation. Why is it important to have a healthy church? What is a church? What, are, what does it mean to be a Christian and part of a church? So he begins the book talking, gives an example uh, and an illustration to kind of furnish his point. He talks about what a healthy church should be because it's important for every Christian to be members of local churches. Now, that's not just taken as a given. Dever goes to great length in this book in explaining why and how Christians are called to be members of local bodies. We'll get more to that in a minute. But he talks about how every single one of us, this is a quotation, every single one of us who is a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ will give an account to whether or not we have gathered together regularly with the church, spurred the church on to greater together Sorry, spurred the church on to love and good deeds and fought to maintain a right teaching of the hope of the gospel. That's his paraphrase of Hebrews 10, 23-25. But he starts with this explanation that we long for a healthy church because that is our responsibility. It is our duty as Christians to be A, a part of a local body, and B, a functioning part of the local body in a way that glorifies Christ in the way that we live. So he starts with the basics. What is a Christian. This is in chapter 1, your Christianity in the church. He says a Christian is someone who, first and foremost, has been forgiven of his sin and reconciled to God the Father through Jesus Christ. This happens when a person repents of his sins, 
and puts his faith in the perfect life, substitutionary death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. In other words, a Christian is someone who has reached the end of himself with his own moral resources. He continues that a person who is a Christian turns from the idols of their life, who recognizes that this life will not satisfy them, who longs to be free of the enslavement of sin and to be reconciled to their Creator. And not only are we reconciled to God, our Creator, but in being reconciled to God through Christ, we are also being reconciled one to another. We have this union, this union with Christ and with one another in his church. We are a family with God. We are adopted by him. We are included in his family, his fellowship, his body and bride, a people and a temple, a lady and her children. He makes this distinction between what theologians call the universal church, that is, all Christians everywhere throughout history, so members of the universal church, that's all those who have trust and genuine faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, the role of history, from the first apostles, even truly to uh, the very first believers, to back to Adam and Eve, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, everyone who believed in the promise of the true God for salvation through faith is a member of the local church. And the local church is that who, sorry, the universal church is, is all of that. It's all encompassing and it's universal. But the local church, he says, is those people who meet down the street from you to hear the word preached and to practice baptism and the Lord's Supper. One of the taglines of the Reformation, I think it was, it was either Luther or Calvin who said this, but they said that, the marks of the true church is where the gospel is rightly preached and the sacraments are rightly administered. That is to say, baptism and the Lord's Supper. These are the true churches where the word is not preached, where there is no baptism in the Lord's Supper. You cannot with confidence or with rightly dividing uh, with discernment say that that is a true church of Christ because it's not being most foundationally obedient to what he has commanded them. He goes on explaining a lot of this. He gives... It's a lot more in-depth. This is really just a survey. So he talks again about what a church is and what it isn't, chapter 2. He says that it's a, it's a people, not a place. Uh, we make the distinction often in our kind of evangelical culture today that the church is a people, not a building, and that's true. It is a people. He says it's the new covenant, blood-bought people of God. That is the church. It's his body. It's his bride. It's the temple of the Holy Spirit. It's a caring people, uh, people who come together not only to love and serve Christ, but to love and serve one another, as we are called to in the Gospels. The, all of the one another's in the Gospel, love one another, serve one another, pray for one another, care for one another. We come together with the responsibility, he says, to love, serve, encourage, and hold accountable the rest of our church family. Chapter 3, what every church should aspire to be, healthy. Uh, obviously, on, in Earth, we desire for our families to be healthy, uh, and so obviously that reflects the pattern of our church family. The family of God should be a healthy family. He, he gives the definition that a healthy church is a congregation that increasingly reflects God's character, as his character has been revealed in his word. Some important components, a healthy church is a congregation. Each of us individually are members of the universal church, but the local church is that body, that gathering, that congregation of people meeting together, not just on Sundays, but every day when they come together to study God's word, to pray together, to sing to him, to, to live in fellowship with one another. That is the church meeting. Although the church does have a special certain day per the teachings of the New Testament, we meet together on Sunday to worship him in spirit and truth, with prayer, with song, with worship, and uh, with the reading and praying of his word. And that it's the, the duty of the healthy church. What a healthy church is, is that which increasingly reflects God's character. It is one that is growing individuals into the likeness of Christ, and as a group shows the story of the gospel through the way that they live. It proclaims that message, and it shows the effects of Christ's saving work, as is revealed in God's Word. Because we know that we don't, we don't live as Christians with just kind of, well, I, I think you know, this is a good trait. Being loving is nice. Being kind is nice. Let's go do that. No, we live as has been revealed to us in God's Word. We live 
according to the way that God has told us, has shown us, that God has written the scriptures by his spirit through human authors uh, with the intention of revealing himself to us. And only only revealing himself, but highlighting how we are to live after the pattern of Christ. He talks about the story of redemption, the story of the gospel, tracing it through scripture. How we were created after the image of God, but in the fall we were distorted, we were guilty and corrupt. In original sin, Romans 5 says that in Adam fall, all fell. When Adam sinned, all sinned. That we all have been made guilty from birth because of this. And that because of that, we all are inclined towards sin, so that none of us is innocent. None of us can say before God that, oh, I was clean, I was perfect, I measured up. No, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So God took the people of Israel, covenanted with them, who brought them into the holy land, uh, the promised land, yet they still disobeyed. And so he brought Christ. He brought Christ in the fullness of time as the deliverer, the Messiah, to save them by faith, to die after living a perfect life, dying a perfect sacrificial death, an atoning death, that by faith all of us who are united to him are counted righteous in him, so that we may live reconciled to God as sons and daughters of God. And then he calls us as the church, as the congregation, the called out people of God to live in a certain way because of that. The ultimate how-to guide, how to display God's character. That's chapter 4, talking about God's word. According to what Jesus himself taught, the way that we live in a way pleasing to God is by his spirit, obeying and following, listening to the word of God. It is the spirit of God who, who inspired the word of God. And so to be obedient to him is to be obedient to his word. As I thought the other day that to say that, oh, I follow Jesus, but I don't follow the Bible is to say like, oh, I serve the king, but I don't serve his laws. Like, that doesn't make any sense. To obey a person is to obey their commandments. And the word of God is the commandment of God, the law of God. It's the gospel of God. He goes on through that chapter. I thought this was really cool. He goes on through every book of the New Testament, the 27 books of the New Testament from Matthew to Revelation, picking out all of the pieces where God's word is is focused on as important, as central to our lives as Christians. Great. He then starts part two of the book, the essential marks of a healthy church. These are the three essential marks that truly make a healthy church. That Without these three marks, you cannot say that your church is healthy because it's in some way falling short of what Christ has patterned for us, who has, through his disciples, by his spirit, by his word, taught us to live as Christians. The first one, Dever has is one of the big staples of his ministry. The essential mark of a healthy church, chapter 5, expositional preaching. Now that's a big word. Uh, maybe some of us have never heard it before. It wasn't the style of preaching that I grew up with. He defines expositional preaching as that kind of preaching that quite simply exposes the word of God. It takes a particular passage of scripture, explains the explains that passage, and then applies the meaning of that passage to the life of the congregation. Um, it's uh, set in contrast with different types of preaching, like topical preaching, which gathers up one or more scriptures on a particular topic, uh, such as prayer or giving, or biographical preaching, which takes the life of someone in the Bible and portrays the individual's life as a display of God's grace and as an example of hope and holiness. He says, and these other types may be employed helpfully on occasion, but the regular diet of the church should consist of the explanation and application of particular portions of God's world, God's word, sorry. You may have grown up like I did, that's more topical, it's more by topic or by thought, by certain series and not preaching through certain specific passages of scripture. Um, and so this, this was something that knew for me as I was growing in my understanding of the faith. But I really think that expositional preaching has transformed my life in in so many ways, helping me to grow an understanding of God's word by sitting under godly pastors who are rightly dividing God's word of truth. He says that an expositional preacher's authority begins and ends with scripture. Because if a person is only ever preaching on the topics that they like and not being forced to dig through all of those passages that 
that they haven't dug through before, then only they can teach is what they already know. Um, but if a, a preacher is being forced to work through a passage in its context, pulling out the actual meaning and intention of the context, then not only does that pastor grow, but the congregation grows with him. You know, there are so many examples of pastors who have, you know, the same five topics, who have the same 20 chapters of the Bible that they just flip-flop back and forth on with different lights, different angles, different focuses. And while those may be good and helpful and true, they are missing out on so much for themselves and for their church bodies because they aren't giving it the fullness of the whole counsel of God. They aren't preaching all of God's word in its fullness. God's people have always been created by God's Word. It is God's Word which created the universe. It is God's Word which called individuals to salvation, as God's Word through his gospel still calls individuals out today. It's God's Word in written form that informs us as how we are to live as Christians, as members of local churches. At the heart of God's worship is hearing God's Word and responding to it in the way that we live. The next one is biblical theology. It's an essential mark of the healthy church. Now, you should distinguish this from the type of systematic or the type of theological study called biblical theology. That's more tracing the themes, the types and symbols and shadows of scripture. Here he's talking about biblical theology simply as theology that is biblical. Theology that simply comes from the Bible. He gives a fuller definition that biblically sound theology is theology that is faithful to the teaching of the entire Bible. It is reliably and accurately interpreting the parts of the in terms of the whole. And he goes on to explain like the New Testament focus on sound doctrine and First Timothy, Second Timothy, through the pastoral epistles especially, false doctrine, be warned of it, sound doctrine, uh, instruct this, sound doctrine, sound doctrine. Uh, Encourage others by sound doctrine. Refute those who abuse it. A false teachers should be rebuked. Uh, teach what is in accord with sound doctrine over and over and over again. Preachers should teach sound doctrine, doctrine that is reliable, accurate, and faithful to the Word of God. Um, he talks a little bit about unity, diversity, and charity, how we have different understandings of what the Bible actually teaches, and there is some room for disagreement there. Um, he gives that the way the early church put it, that in essentials, unity, in non-essentials, diversity, and in all things, charity. And I think that's really important for how we live today. I think that there are core, central, first-order issues like the deity of Christ, the, the nature of God and the Trinity, the word of God, salvation through Jesus Christ, the nature of man as sinful and needing a Savior. These are first-order issues, salvation by faith. And then there are second-order things, things that may be difficult for people who disagree on to worship together, stuff like, should you baptize infants or only baptize professing believers? Um, you know, the roles of men and women in the church, the specifics of how that's worked out. Those may be important and should not be neglected or swept under the rug, but they may not necessarily be things that disqualify people from being true believers of Christ. He goes on to talk about complex and controversial topics, um, stuff like the sovereignty of God and salvation, stuff again like baptism, about the, the, the nature of the Lord's Supper, about men and women and their relationship in the church. Um, there are so many different examples of stuff like that that we need to be charitable on, to not be quick to cast the heresy label on other people that we disagree with. Uh, chapter 7, third essential mark is a biblical understanding of the good news, that is, the gospel. Every part of our Christian life revolves around that news that Jesus Christ has come into the world to save sinners. He says that the gospel is the good news that Jesus, dies, that Jesus Christ died on the cross as his sacrificial substitute for sinners and rose again, making a way for us to be reconciled to God. It's the news that the judge will become the father. If only we repent, believe. He goes through four points he always tries to share when he's giving a, a presentation of the gospel. It's God, his holiness, man, our sinfulness, Christ, salvation through him, and our response, responding in faith. We need God. We need God himself and not just the things that he gives us. 
uh, we shouldn't present the gospel only as the effects of the gospel. We shouldn't be like, yeah, come to Jesus and he'll give you, he lists, you want joy, peace, happiness, fulfillment, self-esteem, or love. To present only these things as the gospel itself is to do what J is to present a partial truth, what Packer says a half truth, masquerading as the whole truth, becoming a complete untruth. And then because of the outflow of the gospel, because of the preaching and proclamation of the gospel through personal evangelism, the church grows and reflects the character of God. He then moves to part two, which is important mar marks of the church. These are um, not absolute essentials, but again, are things that are important for each of us as believers to understand and to practice so that we would have healthy churches and to reflect Christ as well as we can. He talks about um, the statement of faith his church adopted when it first opened in 1878. That's an old church um, talking about repentance and faith, separate duty or sacred duties and inseparable graces. Uh, things that are brought by regeneration through new birth. He, sa he says in the simplest terms that conversion equals repentance and faith. Conversion is turning with our lives, our whole lives, from self-justification to Christ's justification. Self-rule to God-rule. Idol worship to God-worship. That is salvation. That is turning from your own deeds to your own righteousness, to your own satisfaction, turning to Christ, turning from sin. We had an episode early on about what is the gospel. And if you haven't heard that, I would encourage you to go back and listen to it. It's a longer one. Maybe we'll release a shorter one in the future, giving a more condensed version. But I think that's essentially important for all of us to have a deep and meaningful understanding of the gospel. That it's not just, you know, pray this prayer and go to heaven. No, it's be born again. Come to life, spiritual life, by the power of the Spirit of God. Be united to the Son of God. Be reconciled to God, your Creator. The next uh, important mark of a healthy church, he says, is a biblical understanding of evangelism. So if we understand the gospel well, it's important to actually go and give it out. Evangelism, he says, is speaking words. It's sharing news. It's being faithful to God by presenting the good news. Christ, by his death and resurrection, making a way for a holy God and a sinful people to be reconciled. God will produce true conversions when we present the good news. In short, evangelism is presenting the good news freely and trusting God to convert people. Paul said that I planted and Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. We throw out that seed, that seed of the gospel, the truth of salvation through Christ. We set it out plainly. We go out with boldness. Uh, we, we, we urge them to turn from their sin and turn to Christ, but we understand that only God can bring the fruit of conversion. Only the Spirit of God can make someone spiritually alive. Only by God's work of regeneration can someone truly come to a saving faith. The next mark is a biblical understanding of membership. And this is something that, again, is more controversial today because, you know, membership, it sounds like a, joining a country club. But no, he said. Membership is, is committing to gather, give, pray and serve together, to come together and uh, to submit to the accountability of living in community with your brothers and sisters. He says, joining a church is an act of saying, I am now your responsibility and you are now my responsibility. Membership means taking responsibility. Um, it helps to establish ourselves as professing members of the church. And that involves biblical church discipline as well. That's the next mark. Uh, to be a member draws a boundary line between the church and marking off the church from the world. Discipline helps the church that lives inside the boundary line to stay true to the very things that, they, for, that are the cause for drawing the line in the first place. Church discipline is excluding someone who pres professes to be a Christian from membership in a church and participation in the Lord's Supper for serious, unrepented sin, sin they refuse to let go of. Now, that may sound harsh, but it is thoroughly biblical. It is what Scripture teaches. You can look at Matthew chapter 18, Luke chapter 17. You can look at 1 Corinthians near, I think, 5, uh, 3 through 5, somewhere around there, about to expel the wicked brother from among you. Not as an act of condemnation, but as an act of love. To push them out, saying, you are endangering your, your eternal soul by living in this unrepentant sin. Urging them to come to repentance. 
that the reason that we have for discipline is to save the soul of this sinful individual. Again, another biblical uh, mark of a church is biblical discipleship and growth. Uh, discipleship, which is one of the main focuses of this program, of this podcast and ministry, is to help you grow as disciples of Christ. He gives a couple examples of what that looks like, growing in holiness, but also with a few possibilities of what it looks like in a church as it grows as disciples. He gives growing members uh, being called to mission, older members getting a fresh sense of responsibility in evangelism and discipling younger members, younger members attending the funerals of the older members out of love, increased prayer in the church, more members sharing the gospel, more spontaneous ministry activities, not the pastor having to uh, lead everything, but people going out and ministering themselves, spiritual conversation, confession of sin, pointing one another to the cross, increased sacrificial giving, increasing fruit of the Spirit, uh, sacrifices, career, uh, husbands leading their wives sacrificially, wives submitting to their husbands, as Scripture calls them, to, parents discipling their children in the faith, a willingness of the church body to discipline the unrepentant public sin, and a corporate love for the sinner shown in the pursuit of him or her before, gospel, before discipline is enacted. These are essential marks of, the, of a church. Also, biblical church leadership, to have uh, biblical elders and deacons. Now, this is one of my personal deep convictions, that every church should be led, as the New Testament teaches, by two sets of leaders, by the, de the deacons, who are the servants of the church, and the elders, who are the spiritual leaders of the church. He expands this argument very fully and very well in this passage. Um, there are three terms, uh, overseer or bishop, elder and pastor or shepherd, that are all three used for the same men, for the office of elder. Um, elders, he says, are especially devoted to prayer and to the ministry of the word for the church, while deacons help to sustain the church's physical operation. He goes into depth uh, explaining these in great detail, presenting valid arguments, I think. He says deacons are generally concerned with the practical details of church life administrations, maintenance, and the care of church members with physical needs. He draws this deeply from the pastoral epistles, from the New Testament, from the Gospels themselves, from Jesus' words, from the, the standards set by the book of Acts. And I, that's, again, it's a place where you may disagree with me. Maybe your church is led by a deacon board, or by a single elder and no deacon, or maybe you don't have elders at all. But I would urge you to look through these issues, to pray through these issues. I would urge you to go find this book for yourself. You may disagree with certain points, and I think that's okay. I think if you are meaningfully working through these issues, examining it by Scripture, praying for the wisdom of the Spirit working through these things, submitting to God's Word and its truth, then disagree if you have to disagree. But by all means, challenge yourself. Be challenged. Go and seek out truth, even if that means sacrificing something, even if it means admitting that you were wrong. I encourage you to go and buy this book. It's a shorter book, smaller book. It's available at ninemarks.com or from Crossway or for Amazon, whatever, I'm sure. Uh, the back is marked $10.99 US dollars, but I'm sure you can find that for cheaper somewhere online. So in, in closing, because we're going a little long now, uh, what is a Healthy Church by Mark Dever, published by Crossway, is part of Nine Marks Ministries. I give this book a solid review. I say this is a deep book, a meaningful book. I loved it. I was encouraged by it. I grew in my understanding of what Christians are called to and what the church is called to be, of the reality of what a healthy church is. So go and buy that book. Uh, thank you for listening. If you made it this far, follow us again on social media. Uh, listen on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Play, SoundCloud, or YouTube. Please leave a rate and review on iTunes or on Facebook. It's tremendously helpful. And share this with a friend. Maybe get together with a group of friends. Listen to this individually and then buy this book. Come and study it together. I think it would be fantastic for a small group resource, especially for those who are looking to be leaders in their church. So until next time, love God, love the church, and love your neighbor as yourself. I'll see you around.